Well, I, I'm the one that's uh, that's honored, and uh, particularly because this lectureship is named after Dr. Bromold, who uh, was my uh, professional uh, father and has been my mentor and continues to be my mentor uh, today. We were just speaking yesterday about uh, plans for the future of his textbook, Heart Disease. Um, these are my competing interests. This says that I consult widely, uh, but I note that I do not accept any personal payment from any uh, pharmaceutical or device company that markets a product. Well, uh, Valentin Fuster, who's a real hero of our field, invited uh, me a few years ago uh, to write a piece trying to put atherosclerosis in some historical perspective. I'd like to start my talk by rehearsing uh, what we went through in this paper. Let's start uh, you know, hundreds of years ago uh, when there was a pitched battle between uh, Virchow, Rudolf Virchow and von Rokitansky about the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis. Uh, Virchow, on the basis of careful observation, had deduced that atherosclerosis actually had some aspects of inflammation. And uh, he called it an Entzündungsreaktion, uh, very clearly in the middle of the 19th century. Von Rokitansky uh, took another view, and he thought that the atheroma arose by incorporation of thrombi. Uh, so that was the hot debate of the mid-19th century. Well, then the era of chemistry arose, and it was found that uh, cholesterol is a component of the atherosclerotic plaque by Otto Windholz, and that uh, you could feed animals a diet enriched in cholesterol and saturated fat. This was in rabbits by Anishkov and Cholodov. And so the focus uh, for many decades was on atherosclerosis as a lipid storage disease. Then there was the advent of the era of cell biology. Uh, the role of LDL, low density lipoprotein, when the ultracentrifuge was uh, introduced, uh, was very clear. There's observational epidemiology that shows that LDL is permissive and probably causal for human atherosclerosis based on human genetics and interventional studies. But you know, all of those observations don't tell us how LDL is promoting atherosclerosis. And that's where I think we're headed here. Um, you know, when the culture of cells became possible in homogeneous populations, uh, the late Russell Ross was one of the champions, and his view was that atherosclerosis was caused by a bland, smooth muscle proliferation. And he was uh, joined by his mentor, uh, Earl Bendit, in that concept. So this is from the original ideas that uh, Russell Ross and John Glomps had had about the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis. Uh, there's endothelial denuding injury. There are platelets that will release their granular contents, including platelet-derived growth factor. That will cause the smooth muscle cells to migrate from the media into the intima, as you see here, and uh, to proliferate there. And what's amazing about uh, this construct, which Dr. Ross did eventually revise, was that there's no inflammation whatsoever. So he skated past Virchow's observations from uh, over 100 years before, and considered atherosclerosis a bland process. Well, in the 1980s, the tools became available, particularly monoclonal antibodies for immunohistochemical staining, uh, that allowed us to really nail what the cells were that were participating in an atherosclerosis. And I'd like to take you on a little walk through memory lane here. Um, Johan Hans and I, who've been talking about this and working together for many decades, were at a meeting of the Scandinavian Atherosclerosis Society. And we were sitting around the fireplace, uh, perhaps with a glass of wine at the end of a busy and informative day. And someone came by and said, so you guys, what's new in this business of immunity and, and inflammation and atherosclerosis? Well, that spurred us to uh, write a review uh, that we submitted to the Journal of Clinical Investigation. And as Johan reminded me, we got a letter back uh, from the editor-in-chief without review saying, that this looked very nice, but it was not of sufficient interest, uh, general interest to merit consideration for publication of JCL. So we published it in this uh, pathology journal. And if you look at the table of contents, it's uh, actually strikingly modern, even though it was published uh, more than three uh, decades ago. Um, 
just give, I'll give you a second. I'm not going to read this, but uh, some of the questions that we asked back then have been answered in part, and some of the other questions we're still struggling with. Oh, I do want to make a very important point that I already alluded to, and that is that there's not a competition between traditional risk factors such as LDL and inflammatory and immune pathways. The idea is that inflammation provides a series of pathways that can transduce the effects of some of these traditional risk factors and provide us a mechanistic explanation of how they are altering the biology of the artery wall and leading to the disease. So I'm not going to go through this with you. Everyone has cartoons like this in their own collection when we transition from the normal human arterial wall. Uh, welcome these visitors, perhaps unwelcome visitors, to the intima, the leukocytes, about which we'll have something to say in a moment. Uh, then there's the phase of progression of the disease when indeed we have some of those processes that Dr. Ross advocated so strongly in the 1970s. And there's also cell death that goes on in the advanced atherosclerotic plaque. And then ultimately, uh, disruption of the plaque causes some of the clinical complications that bring the patients to our attention as clinicians most dramatically. Um, in previous lectures, I'm sure many of you have heard me talk about the uh, almost quarter century of work that we did taking apart the cell and molecular mechanisms of plaque rupture which is a common cause, the most common cause of coronary thrombosis. And the story that we told is that when we have inflammation in the intima, as depicted here by the blue T lymphocytes, if you will, and the yellow macrophage foam cells, uh, that we have a perfect storm for a thrombotic complication of atherosclerosis. The T cells secrete gamma interferon that inhibits the production of new collagen required to repair and maintain that all-important fibrous cap extracellular matrix that is all that stands between many of our patients and acute coronary syndromes. We also spend a great deal of time working out the inflammatory conversations, perhaps between T cells and macrophages as shown here, that cause the inflammatory cells to elaborate large quantities of specialized enzymes members of the matrix metalloproteinase family by and large that are specialized in cleaving these very stable extracellular macromolecules such as collagen, interstitial collagen. Uh, so when we have inflammation, we put the repair of the fibrous cap in jeopardy and we boost the mechanisms that can dissolve that extracellular matrix and render a plaque friable and susceptible to rupture. Um, for over the last uh, six or eight years, my laboratory has turned to try to understand the mechanisms of superficial erosion, which accounts these days for about a quarter of acute coronary syndromes. And uh, we've worked out the, uh, some mechanisms, uh, as have others, and we think also that healing of the atherosclerotic plaque, once it's disrupted, is very important in the progression of the disease. We think that uh, there are quite distinct mechanisms for superficial erosion and plaque rupture. I've already shown my hand that we think that the macrophage, uh, the mononuclear phagocyte, is very important in plaque rupture. We have now implicated the polymorphonuclear leukocyte and neutrophil extracellular traps in superficial erosion. So uh, stay tuned. This is a, a pretty hot topic now in acute coronary syndrome pathophysiology. Well, this is from uh, the uh, late 2000s and shows uh, some of the denizens uh, of the atherosclerotic plaque uh, that uh, we had characterized uh, at that point. And of course, now in the era of single cell RNA sequencing, um, I couldn't possibly incorporate on one slide any comprehensible listing of the different classes of leukocytes that there are. Uh, but certainly those are what I referred to as the unwelcome visitors to the arterial wall, and that are key in playing out these inflammatory pathways that we think link risk factors to the progression and complication of atherosclerosis. So what contributes to the accumulation of these leukocytes? Is it recruitment from blood? Is it local proliferation within the plaques? Is it extramedullary hematopoiesis or hematopoiesis in the bone marrow? And it turns out it's all of the above. Now, I don't have time uh, to go into all of this and uh, perhaps 
uh, you should invite uh, Matthias Narendorf, who's a panelist here, and Philip Zrisky uh, to talk about uh, some of the uh, issues here, which they have really uh, illuminated in recent years. And what is it that triggers the accumulation of leukocytes in the atherosclerotic plaque? Well, there's a whole laundry list of traditional and non-traditional or emerging risk factors. And the answer, of course, is all of these are associated with attracting or causing the accumulation of leukocytes in the atherosclerotic plaque. What are the messengers that cause this recruitment or expansion of the population of the leukocytes? Well, there are cytokines that are protein mediators of inflammation and immunity. There are lipid mediators that are very important and that also may, may play a role in the resolution of inflammation and healing, and they're reactive oxygen species. Now, I certainly can't go into all of these categories, but I would like to stick to where I think we've had the most translational success, uh, because unfortunately, uh, targeting oxidative metabolism has not yielded clinical results so far. So I'm going to talk about uh, cytokines. Now, back in that paper that uh, we wrote in, in response to a jocular challenge uh, many years ago, and it was uh, rejected without review by the Journal of Clinical Investigation, we included this table. And if you look at this table, it actually held up pretty well in the ensuing three decades. Uh, so the conversations about uh, cells of the atherosclerotic plaque, uh, both the intrinsic cells, endothelial cells and skin muscle cells, and the leukocytes, those of innate immunity and of adaptive immunity, and the uh, players that they secrete and that alter the biology of the atheroma is actually pretty pretty good. Not complete, but we, we got some of this right. And that was on the basis of work that we were conducting in our laboratories. Uh, back in 1986, um, quite contrary to immunological dogma, we showed that human vascular cells, endothelial cells are shown here, but also smooth muscle cells could express the messenger RNA that encodes interleukin-1 beta. Uh, this caused uh, quite a bit of, of ruckus, where the immunologists thought that uh, non-properly pedigreed immunologic cells were not capable of producing these wonderful mediators that were called interleukins. Their very name suggests that they're limited to signaling between leukocytes. We also showed, by the way, in this original paper in 1986, the biological activity in the protein synthesis, uh, and also IL-1 alpha, as well as IL-1 beta. And you'll note that we had to induce the expression of these inflammatory mediators. In the basal state, they did not express these messenger RNA that encoded IL-1 beta or alpha. And we used what we thought was an artifice in the laboratory, bacterial endotoxin, gram-negative bacterial endotoxin, lipopolysaccharides, the stimulus. Of course, now with our increased appreciation of the microbiome and of impaired epithelial barrier function in certain conditions, LPS seems much more relevant pathophysiologically than we had conceived in the mid-1980s. Well, we very soon after that discovered that IL-1 can induce its own gene expression. And this provided an amplification loop. And we showed, uh, together with Charles Dinarello, who is the godfather of the interleukin biology field, uh, in vivo in rabbits and in human mononuclear phagocytes that IL-1 can induce its own gene expression. We then went on and showed that IL-1 can induce another pro-inflammatory cytokine, uh, about which I'll have a great deal to say during this talk, interleukin-6. Here is another amplification loop. A little bit of IL-1 alpha will beget huge amounts of interleukin-6. This is from smooth muscle cells. Uh, it also works with endothelial cells, but in terms of the bulk of uh, production, we think of the intrinsic vascular cells, smooth muscle cells, will win that uh, contest. Note that this is a log-log scale. So this is a huge induction of IL-6. Now, interleukin-1 beta, like many proteins that are pivotal in biological control, requires a proteolytic cleavage to convert it from an inactive precursor to the active mature cytokine. The enzyme that affects that cleavage is caspase-1, originally known as interleukin-1 beta-converting enzyme, or ICE. We localized this enzyme to 
foam cells in the human lesion in the mid 1990s. We then showed in the biochemical laboratory that a pro-inflammatory mediator that we already knew was active in the atherosclerotic plaque could coax the cleavage of the inactive pro-IL-1 beta to the active form in a way that was dependent on the activity of caspase 1. What we didn't know when we were doing those experiments was at the same time in his laboratory in Rosanne, the late Jörg Scholl showed that caspase 1 is the business end of a supramolecular structure we now call the inflammasome that senses danger, including some disease-relevant stimuli, such as cholesterol crystals or hypoxia, and that will activate the production of the mature forms of IL-1-beta and its cousin IL-18, and then we're off and running because, as I've discussed, we have the first amplification loop, we have the second amplification loop, and this is very formally similar to what we see with the coagulation cascade or the complement cascade, where we have a series of tightly regulated steps uh, that control a biochemical, biological pathway. Why were we interested in IL-6 in the mid-1980s? Because we already knew that it was the switch that turns on the acute phase response in the liver, telling the hepatocyte to divert some of its substrate and energy from housekeeping proteins like albumin and getting ready for emergencies by increasing the production of acute phase reactants, prominently fibrinogen, the precursor of clots, and the major inhibitor of our endogenous fibrinolytic system, plasminogen activator inhibitor 1. Now, these are bad biomarkers for various reasons, but a great biomarker, although not in the causal pathway for inflammation, is C-reactive protein and another pentraxin, serum amyloid A, which the mouse prefers to CRP for those who are murine experimentalists. So what is it that contributes to the accumulation of the leukocytes in the atherosclerotic plaque? Well, I told you it was all of the above, and I'd like to just focus for a bit on hematopoiesis in the bone marrow, which is something that has interested us. And uh, in particular, I have uh, learned a lot about inflammatory signaling in the bone marrow niche uh, from Matthias and Phil. And in uh, recently published experiments, when they isolated uh, bone marrow endothelial cells from animals with experimental atherosclerosis that consumed an atherogenic diet, Western diet, WD, and did the usual kind of uh, volcano plot, they found that interleukin-6 was prominently overexpressed when we compare the atherosclerotic bone marrow endothelial cells to those derived from control animals. And uh, using the, uh, the fantastic technology of genetic engineering, which is available today, uh, the virtuosos uh, in the Mass General group, although Phil has now uh, moved to Mount Sinai, engineered animals that have inducible inhibition of the expression of interleukin-6 in endothelial cells. And then we're able to functionally implicate IL-6 in aspects of hematopoiesis as the reduction in these precursor cells, the reduction in the proliferation of the precursor cells, and in peripheral blood, a decrease in the pro-inflammatory subset of mononuclear phagocytes, and even the neutrophils decrease. So there's a it looks like there's a global inhibition uh, reduction in myelopoiesis when IL-6 is deficient in endothelial cells in the bone marrow. So this is the um, summative figure in this publication uh, that really implicates IL-6 as a key mediator in the bone marrow niche in hematopoiesis, which can then affect atherosclerosis. Well, another way in which we can have an increase in accumulation of myeloid cells is due to what we call clonal hematopoiesis, uh, which is due to somatic or acquired mutations. And in keeping with this being sponsored by an aging journal, this is a brand new field which links aging, cancer, and cardiovascular disease. 
If you'd like to learn more about it, I would refer you to this review, although there are a number, there are probably as many reviews about this uh, topic as there are data papers at the present time. So how does this work? Well, with age, hematopoietic stem cells can acquire somatic mutations in a subset of known leukemia driver genes that favor the expansion of clones of mutant cells, and they can accumulate in peripheral blood. And this is indeed a first step on the road to leukemia. Individuals who have more than 2% uh, mutated cells with a variant allele fraction, uh, VAF of 2, without hematologic malignancy, are denoted as having clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, or CHIP. Why indeterminate? Because the transition to acute leukemia requires the acquisition of up to three or four of these mutations, somatic mutations in known leukemia driver genes. And it actually happens rather uncommonly, less than 1% per year. Uh, so most people who have this condition, which we call CHIP for short, uh, will never have a clinical manifestation, at least in terms of transition to a hematologic malignancy. So why should we care about that as cardiovascular or scientists and clinicians? Because although the transition to acute leukemia that requires multiple mutations, just a single mutation in a clone can accelerate atherosclerosis and thrombosis and heart failure. And now it's hard to open a journal without seeing something else that's associated uh, with CHIP. There's some controversy about the magnitude of these effects. We think that a lot of that has to do with the population study and with the stringency of calling the mutations. This is a common risk factor, as I'll show you in a moment, but it also is a very potent risk factor. Fully adjusted for all traditional risk factors, if you have CHIP, there's about an 80% increase in your risk of having cardiovascular disease. And that is on the same, the same scale as hypertension and cholesterol, and is outweighed, of course, by age, which is what we're all interested in in this particular webinar, and also uh, diabetes. So this is a, a very potent risk factor. And it's common. Uh, as you see, by the time you're 70, and the world literature really pretty much agrees with this, you have at least a 10% chance of having this condition of clonal hematopoiesis. This is from work of Alex Bick and Pradeep Natarajan, uh, two of my brilliant collaborators. And although there's uh, several dozen known leukemia driver genes, only a few, only a handful of these leukemia driver genes cause this condition of clonal hematopoiesis, notably DMT3A and TET2. And in particular, TET2 is the one that we uh, think is the most likely associated with cardiovascular disease. So, of course, there are two possibilities, aren't there? Uh, one is that these acquired mutations, which come with exposure to environmental mutagens and aging, are just like counting the uh, rings around the trunk of a tree. And since age is that very strong driver of atherosclerotic risk, it, it's simply a commensal. It's simply uh, true, true, and unrelated. And that's why uh, we got together with the discoverers of CHIP, Ben Ebert and Sid Jaswal, and helped with mouse experiments to test the causality. We created mice that had uh, bone marrow cells that had lack of function of TET2 and did the usual atherosclerosis experiment, and lo and behold, found an acceleration of atherosclerosis. And this was uh, conducted really in parallel with work from Ken Walsh's laboratory. Uh, that was very similar and came up with the same kind of answer. Now, once you've made these animals, you can make monocyte-derived macrophages and expose them to some of our traditional risk factors. And for example, LDL cholesterol and perform RNA sequencing. And when we did that with uh, SID, we found our frenemies, IL-1 beta, and right downstream of IL-1 beta, as I showed you, IL-6 are overexpressed by these mutant leukocytes. But that's in mice. What about in humans? Well, again, Alex and Pradeep and their team looked in TopMed, the uh, NIH uh, consortium of, of trials with pool data, and found that in TET2 clone hematopoiesis that IL-1 beta and IL-6 were overexpressed. 
Moreover, it looks like the IL-6 is functional because there's a common variant. 40% uh, of you on this, on this Zoom have a variant which uh, attenuates IL-6 signaling. And if you look in people who do not have CHIP, uh, the cumulative event rate is the same, whether or not you have this impaired function of IL-6 signaling. But if you have CHIP, uh, you see you have a much accentuated risk of atherosclerotic events. And there's uh, very uh, compelling data that we have to consider the idea that atherosclerosis can feed back on the bone marrow and augment the leukopoiesis and, and the expansion of these clones. And that's work of Kamila Naksarova, uh, which uh, Matthias knows very well. And uh, this is another dimension of this link between the bone marrow hematopoiesis and atherosclerosis. So what, what are the mechanisms? Well, both of these mechanisms are actually operating in the human atherosclerotic milieu and as well as the mice. But do the experimental results in the mice regarding enhanced hematopoiesis and atherosclerosis actually apply to humans? And for that, we're very fortunate that Professor Fuster was able to undertake a community study. Actually, this is in the, the um, employees of the Santander Bank in Madrid. Uh, and he has created a cohort known as PESA, the Progression of Early Subclinical Atherosclerosis, where he's done pan imaging of these volunteers, mostly men, middle-aged, and without obvious cardiovascular disease. And this is turning out to be a goldmine of information. And in one paper that we were happy to publish in the European Heart Journal, they used the bone marrow uptake of, uh, of labeled fluorodeoxyglucose to examine metabolic activity. Actually, going back to uh, the, the work of Warburg in the 1930s about increased glucose uptake as a sign of metabolic activity and glycolytic flux. And looking in the lumbar spine, in the frontal plane and also in the lateral plane, you see greater uptake of glucose in the participants in PESA that had the constellation of risk factors that we lump in the metabolic syndrome compared to controls. And actually this technique was something that was uh, worked out uh, in part by Matthias Narendorf and Zahi Fayad, uh, which was adopted by the PESA study. Uh, now, uh, we had the opportunity to comment on this very important study with Matthias and Phil and sort of uh, coordinate the mouse work, which had been uh, championed by Phil and Matthias here, the different things that are lifestyle and, and uh, risk factor associated, and what was found in this analysis of the PESA study. And so we have very good concordance between the experimental group and the human observations of a link between risk factors and hematopoiesis. Well, this is the Bromwald lecture, which is a particular honor for me. And if we go back again, 30 years, well, Johan and I were, are, were voices crying out in the wilderness about inflammation in atherosclerosis. Uh, Professor Bromwald and uh, Victor Zhao uh, got together and put together this cardiovascular continuum. Uh, this is the original uh, cardiovascular continuum, black and white, simple slide, uh, showing we start out with risk factors, develop atherosclerosis, develop infarct, um, we have loss of muscle, we have remodeling, ventricular enlargement, heart failure, and what we now call advanced heart disease. We don't tell our patients they have end stage. Well, with uh, Phil and Matthias, we've been able to flesh out the cardiovascular continuum, bring it into the 21st century, and uh, really this neural axis is something that's a hot topic now, and that is being expanded, particularly in, in Phil's lab now. And the idea that there's uh, activation of the bone marrow, that the spleen can be a way station for some of these cells and extramedullary hematopoiesis can take place there. And we can have a feedback between the consequences of atherosclerosis and more atherosclerosis. And uh, this is a concept which has really caught fire these days. Okay, so this is the pivot point in this talk because if we go into Google Scholar, it takes us 80 milliseconds to come up with 1.8 million results when we cross inflammation and atherosclerosis. And likewise, immunology and atherosclerosis 
80 milliseconds to come up with over 300,000 hits. Uh, so there's a tremendous amount of forests have uh, been sacrificed in the experimental literature and biomarker data in humans. But how do we cross the valley of death from our experimental work and biomarker studies in humans to actual clinical events? So I have, as AJ suggested in the introduction, devoted much of the last 15, perhaps 20 years to trying to move forward from the test tube, from the animal lab into the clinic and test the hypothesis that targeted anti-inflammatory therapy can improve cardiovascular outcomes in humans. This study uh, was already alluded to. The pivotal study in this field was uh, the canakinumab anti-inflammatory thrombosis outcome study, or CANTOS. Uh, those who wish to uh, delve into the background uh, even deeper than I've already presented, I refer you to this paper. So we designed CANTOS uh, to test the inflammation hypothesis in humans who had survived a myocardial infarction, uh, who were on a full panel of contemporary standard of care secondary prevention, but still had a little bit of inflammation as indicated by an elevation above median for the population in C-reactive protein, that index of inflammation. And uh, we initially were going to have uh, 17,000 patients in the study uh, due to business reasons, the sponsor trimmed it to 10,000. Uh, you already heard from AJ that the, the primary, primary endpoint was met. And here in this pre-specified analysis, looking at people who responded best to the intervention, the antibody canakinumab that targets IL-1 beta, by reducing their C-reactive protein below median, you see that there was a greater than 30% decrease in cardiovascular mortality and in all-cause mortality, the holy grail of clinical trials. Will all anti-inflammatory agents improve cardiovascular outcomes? Well, Dr. Ritker, my clinical uh, partner, designed and conceived and got funded the CERT, Cardiovascular Inflammation Reduction Trial, which used an intervention which has transformed the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis and other inflammatory diseases, weekly low-dose methotrexate. And as you see, the study was a complete null. But if you compare CANTOs to the population that was enrolled in the CERT trial, the intervention did not alter the biomarkers of inflammation, the mediators of inflammation, which were decreased in the CANTOS trial. So in the population studied, methotrexate did not provide benefit and did not actually have an anti-inflammatory effect that we can gauge by biomarkers in that population. Fortunately, we do have a drug that's off the shelf uh, that we can use off-label uh, for cardiovascular endpoints, and that is colchicine, which is an inhibitor of uh, granulocyte uh, microtubular function. And here in the Colcott trial, led by Jean-Claude Tardif, you see in patients who are soon after myocardial infarction, treatment with colchicine provides a remarkable decrease in recurrent cardiovascular events. And an independent study that looked at patients who were further along in the more chronic phase following myocardial infarction, colchicine in low doses was able to decrease recurrent events. Now, colchicine, uh, is associated with a signal for infection, like we saw in the CANTOS trial. And it also is a drug that we wish to avoid in our patients with chronic kidney disease, which uh, really is a large part of the population that we see in secondary prevention these days. So beyond CANTOS, we have colchicine. We don't know really how colchicine works, uh, but it seems to reduce events in certain populations. We have inflammasome inhibitors, and there are at least a dozen programs in pharma and biotech that are targeting the inflammasome upstream of IL-1 beta. And then there's the IL-6 pathway, which I've indicated is causal in aspects of experimental atherosclerosis. Dr. Ritker, more than 20 years ago, showed that your blood level of interleukin-6 correlates with your risk of a first ever cardiovascular event. And there are probably two dozen studies that replicate this original study of Dr. Ritker's. 
we have very strong human genetic evidence that IL-6 is causal. Remember that variant that 40% of you have? If we look in a population of people who have these variants that decrease the function of IL-6 signaling, there is a decrease in the biomarker of inflammation in a gene dosage dependent fashion, and also a decrease in coronary heart disease. So this is extremely strong human genetic evidence for causality of IL-6 in human atherosclerosis. And indeed, IL-1 beta inhibition may work because it blocks that induction of IL-6 that we demonstrated in my laboratory back in the 1980s. Well, we've uh, mined the Cantos trial to provide us some stepping stones for the future. And we found that the residual inflammatory risk in Cantos is associated uh, with IL-6, but reduction, but not with IL-18, which is the cousin of IL-1 beta. And we showed that the outcomes in Cantos related very well to the efficacy of interleukin-6 reduction. As you see here, uh, those who got below the median IL-6 derived a great deal of benefit in Cantos compared to those who were treated with canakinumab, uh, but this is in the uh, broken blue line, did not achieve below median IL-6. So where do we go from here? Well, I talked about how colchicine is something we don't necessarily want to use in our very numerous patients with chronic kidney disease. Uh, so together with a couple of wonderful nephrologists, we went back into Cantos and asked, what is it that drives residual risk in our patients with chronic kidney disease? This is very recently published. So the game here was to uh, take patients without chronic kidney disease in Cantos and those with chronic kidney disease and ask the question, is it inflammation or hypercholesterolemia or both that lead to recurrent events? And if we compare the extreme quartiles in Cantos, those who had the elevation in CRP, the highest levels of CRP, actually had the greatest risk of having recurrent events. But the relationship between LDL and recurrent events in the chronic kidney disease population was null. So it looks like inflammation is really causing much more mischief in the patients with chronic kidney disease than LDL. And that is congruent with what we see from the large-scale clinical trials, that the CKD population or advanced kidney disease population is one of the only places where statins have not proven efficacious in the, the uh, reducing cardiovascular events uh, in the uh, studies like the 4D study and Aurora. So that's at the stage for targeting interleukin-6. And we conducted a phase two trial, actually during the pandemic, with an antibody that selectively blocks interleukin-6 ligand, ziltivecumab. And we looked at just those patients in whom we don't want to use colchicine, those with chronic kidney disease, stage three through five. This was a dose-ranging phase two study. And we found a striking reduction in CRP, which makes sense to you from what I explained about the pathway early in this talk. In Cantos, we got about a 36% reduction in CRP. We had, with the highest dose of ziltivecumab used in this phase two study, an over 90% reduction in CRP. It was sustained. There were concordant changes in a variety of other biomarkers reported in this Lancet study. So that set the stage for another large-scale phase three outcome trial targeting the same population. Why? Chronic kidney disease, because it's a large unmet need. It's a very high cardiovascular risk. I'll be on the cardiovascular consult service as the attending physician next week. And I bet you that half the patients I see will have an impaired um, renal function and will be at elevated cardiovascular risk in association with that disease. And it's a particular biologic state, as we showed. LDL cholesterol seems to be less relevant for outcomes, and inflammation is more relevant. And colchicine, which we can have off the shelf, is relatively contraindicated in that population. So where are we today? In the clinical translation of atherosclerosis, perhaps where Winston Churchill said they were at a turning point in the Second War. 
Now this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. I'd like to thank you so much for the honor of giving this promo lecture. And here is a picture of uh, some of the current denizens in our laboratory finishing a large experiment in times of COVID. Here are some of their, their names. And again, I want to thank my collaborators and um, people in my lab for all of the work that made this possible. So thank you very much.